So hello everyone, welcome to the Space Awareness Webinar Earth 2.0, uh, the future of humankind in space. It's an, a very exciting topic, I guess. Uh, my name is Anastasia Boyko, I work for European Schoolnet and I will be moderating this session today. Our presenter for this session is Dr. Vladimir Bozilov, who holds a PhD in astronomy and works for the Department of Astronomy Faculty of Physics at Sofia University in Bulgaria. He, all, he is also an active science communicator and uh, he is also space awareness uh, dissemination node for Bulgaria. <laughs> in uh, today's webinar, the speaker will discuss the topic of continuously growing number of exoplanets discovered in orbit around stars other than the sun. And the presentation will last 40, 45 minutes. After that, uh, we will dedicate about 15, 20 minutes to your questions. You can already um, comment and uh, ask your questions in chat. I will collect them in the end of the session and address to Vladimir. In case you have any technical issues during the presentation, please uh, write in chat and I will be able to, uh, to uh, advise you how to solve these issues. At the end of these sessions, uh, we will have some time to, um, you, to address your questions uh, to our presenters, so please share your questions now or during the session. And um, now I will, leave, I will leave the floor to Vladimir. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. Hi, many thanks to you Anastasia, to Ivo and to all the participants. It's, a very, it's an honor for me to be your presenter today and as a start I would like to invite you to a journey in a far away future. Maybe in a future where you will spend your summer or winter vacation or on another planet. Imagine having the possibility to book a vacation on another world far away into the deep space. Where would you go? Well, you can chat with me later and tell me your favorite place outside our solar system. Actually, astronomers are calling every planet beyond our solar system an exoplanet. And so far, we have a number of these exoplanets discovered. But the closest one is very, very near our own solar system. Here it goes. 40 trillion kilometers from Earth lies Proxima Centauri B. It's around, it's in orbit around Proxima Centauri, the closest star near our Sun. And the light for, from this star is coming for four, just a little bit over four light years. So if you could step there, maybe you can see this wonderful landscape. And you can check that there is more than one Sun here, here, and there, because Proxima Centauri is part of a triple star system. So imagine the poetry, the romance, and the beautiful landscapes you can see here. And in order to see this, we need our telescopes. We need our science to do the measurements. And so far, we have managed to walk around far away into the deep space. Actually, with the help of current space technology and the current telescopes, both, gro both ground-based and space-based, we have seen the first light in the universe. Now we know, thanks to the science of cosmology, we know that the first light into space came here. This is the cosmic microwave background, just 380,000 years after the Big Bang here, after the, after the point that gave the start of our universe, light began to shine. And then nothing formed for around 300 million years. These are the so-called dark ages. But then the first galaxies and the first planets started to form. And this is what we study with cosmology and modern astrophysics. And we know that the story of our solar system begins in one spiral galaxy. Our Milky Way actually hosts a supermassive black hole in the center, right here. And our solar system is actually traveling around, around the center of this supermassive black hole. If we were very close, it would be very dangerous because there is a higher probability of a star that will explode and destroy the future life. 
If we were outside of this comfortable zone, actually, life on Earth may have never started. And thanks to the discoveries we have made with the Apollo missions, we know that the solar system began to form 4.5 billion years ago. Actually, back then, everything we see around us was a big cloud of dust and gas. But thanks to the force of gravity, this cloud collapsed and formed the protosun here. And from the other dust grains, and thanks to the gravity, all the other planets formed. First, we had the biggest planets, the gas giants, Jupiter and Saturn, and then the smaller planets like Mars, Venus, Mercury, and of course, the Earth. But the Earth back there is nothing like the Earth we see today. Back there, the Earth was striken with a big body, maybe the size of Mars. This giant impact actually tear apart the Earth and formed the Moon. And this happened just a few million years after the Earth and the solar system has been born. And a few million years after that, the Earth was like a big volcano. So the lava was floating on the surface of the Earth and the temperature was a tremendous high. It was 700 degrees Celsius. And then something very beautiful happened. Actually, we had impacts with comets and asteroids. And they bring something very useful, something we are using today. Water. Water from space is actually what is the basic substance of life. Next time when you're drinking water or uh, when you're taking a bath, you can think about space. You can think about this space awareness webinar because part of these water molecules were formed far away in the beginning of the universe and was brought to you by asteroids and comets. And we know that for certain because we can observe the distant active galactic nucleus. So what we see here on this picture is very important. It's on the modern trend in astrophysics. So this is a representation of an active galactic nucleus. This means that we have a very old galaxy and in its center is a supermassive black hole. This means that we have million solar masses, million times the mass of our sun compressed in the size of our solar system. But all this is hidden. We don't see the supermassive black hole because there is this torus, this cloud of dust, and it's stopping our efforts to see the center of the active galactic nucleus. But when the matter is falling down the supermassive black hole, the particles are getting accelerated so much that they radiate. This radiation is right here. These jets of energy are actually characteristic for all active galactic nucleuses. But what's important is that here in the dust that's stopping our view to the center, in this dust astronomer, astronomers have found water, ice crystals, and such active galactic nucleuses are found more than 13 billion years ago, just one billion year after the universe has formed. This means that just a few hundred million years after the universe has started, we have water. We have water formed around the galaxies. And then, with the help of asteroids and comets, this is the way we got water here on Earth. So the question is, is Earth unique? Is Earth the only place that has water, liquid on the surface? Is Earth the only place that's suitable for life as we know it? For life that can uh, walk into the webinars organized by the space awareness community? Well, maybe we are not unique. Now for sure, we know that there are many other planets that are suitable for life. And the best way to find them is using telescopes in space. This is one of the best telescopes we have used so far. This is the Kepler Space Telescope. 
It's launched in August 2009 and so far it has provided a tremendously big amount of data for all the exoplanets in our own galaxy. And here is a point to, 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 to remember. So far, no one has found a planet, an exoplanet, in another galaxy. Say Andromeda, the closest nearby big galaxy to ours. Why is that? It's not because we don't think that there are no exoplanets outside the Milky Way. It's because it's very hard to find these exoplanets. Let me show you how hard it is. So, the Kepler Space Telescope is actually monitoring a very small amount in the Milky Way. It's this part in the Cygnus, Cygnus constellation. And in this small amount, in this square, so far, Kepler has found in 2013, it, 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 it reported the discovery of more than a thousand exoplanets. And last week, when I updated my presentation for this webinar, we had more than 3,529 confirmed exoplanets and more than 65% of them were discovered with the Kepler mission. So this is a very good way you can enter into the space discovery era. There is a very good website, Planet Hunters, that allows you to search for exoplanets in the Kepler data. This is one of the very hot topics in the so-called citizen science. Science made for and with the help of citizens, both professional and amateur astronomers. So the question is, in these 2,330 planets, and in around these more than 300 confirmed exoplanets, is there a twin? our own Earth. And how are we sure that these discoveries are real? How are we sure that Kepler is really seeing an exoplanet? Well, let me show you one of the most powerful methods astronomers use to discover exoplanets. So here you see the star and depending of the viewing angle, you can see a planet passing through the star, covering part of its light. This is called a transit. So when you have a transit, this means that you can measure the size of this planet because you can see the change of the light that's coming from the star towards you, the observer. So the transit method is one of the best ways astronomers are using to see big worlds in space. Why big worlds? Because the larger the planet is, the larger the covered area of the star is. That's why most of those more than 3,000 planets are hot Jupiters, planets that are not suitable for life as we know it. Now we know that on Jupiter there might be that, that there might be very interesting astrophysical phenomena, but there is not this is not a suitable place for life. Water could not be liquid on Jupiter. There is no surface on Jupiter. The conditions are actually deadly for us. That's why most of those 3,000 exoplanets are not suitable for life. But some of them are. And right now we can take a closer look into the best candidates for life outside our solar system. So, in order to do this, we need to define the so-called galactic habitable zone. It's shown in green here. So, if we could take a look on the Milky Way upwards, like we were in another galaxy, we'd see, of course, the supermassive black hole. We'd see our sun here between the two spiral arms. But with the green belt, is marked the, the range of positions that stars can have in order for them to have the same metallicity as our sun. So in astronomy, metals are all chemical elements that are heavier from heavier than hydrogen and helium. So I know, I know, chemists and physicists would be very, very, very upset about this, but for astronomers, everything after hydrogen and helium is metal. So, metallicity is actually showing the portion of the star's content that's metal. 
astronomically speaking. So with the green belt, you can see all the stars with solar metallicity. And why is this important? It's important because new research has shown that only around stars with similar to solar metallicity, there might be enough heavy elements on the planets as iron to allow for complex life forms to evolve. Put simply, this means that if we are here around a very old star, there might be not enough heavy elements to build complex life forms. And if we are here, there is so much so much star forming going on and there is a high probability of destruction thanks to the explosion of supernova that life could not survive. So that's why this is the galactic habitable zone and all, the ast all astronomers are searching for planets into this zone. But that's not enough. If we find a, a star, it might be different than our own sun. So if this is the sun with a surface temperature of around 6000 degrees, then we can have colder stars or hotter stars. This means that it's very important to find planets who are at the right distance. So take the Sun, for example, and Earth. So Earth is right into the right place that water on the Earth's surface can be liquid. But if we, are, we were here more, more like Venus or even Mercury, this means that we would be that and the water on Earth would have vaporized very fast. On the other hand, if we were well beyond the orbit of Mars, any water that has been left would be turned to ice. So liquid water demands a specific position of a planet around its star. And this position dep depends on the star's luminosity, on the star's temperature. So this belt is called the habitable zone. This is the place when, by definition, life can be liquid on any planet or exoplanet discovered. And of course, this can change with time. In 5 billion years, when our sun is going to its end of life and it's turning to a red giant, this zone will be moved much far away. But in the next 5 billion years, we are safe. We are safe here. But we are searching for other planets in the habitable zone of their host stars. And so far, astronomers have found a number of them. One of them is Kepler 186f. So let me take a closer look there. So this is a direct comparison between the Earth and Kepler 186f. So if we compare the orbital parameters, we see the habitable zone of the solar system and the habitable zone of the Kepler-186 system. So far, so good. But there is a problem. You see here our blue marvel, the beauty of our Earth with its oceans and to its complex atmosphere. And here on Kepler-186f, you see nothing. You see nothing because our telescopes are not precise enough to see the atmosphere of exoplanets. But this will change. That will change in April 2019, when the James Webb Space Telescope is finally launched. This means that with the help of the new era in astronomical instruments, we will see, we will have direct imaging of exoplanets and their atmospheres. So we can turn this white unknown into maybe such a beauty as our Earth. So this is what we don't know about Kepler-186f. But we do know that the size of this exoplanet is similar to the size of Earth. That's very important because the size is related with the composition of a planet. That's why many scientists think that Kepler-186f is a rocky planet. And the size also tells us about the gravity of a planet. This means that a planet of this size can hold an atmosphere. If the size was more like Mars, then the atmosphere may have drifted away in space. But an exoplanet with a size of Earth is 
a suitable candidate for our next home. And maybe, maybe there is more than one exoplanet in every exoplanetary system. So let me give you the TRAPPIST-1 system. Actually, it's named after a very famous Belgian beers. So the TRAPPIST-1 is located 39 light years from Earth. So it's in our backyard, astronomically speaking. And in this planet, in, the, in, this, in this planetary system, there are three planets. Three planets that are in the habitable zone. So that's amazing. This was the first discovery with so many exoplanets in the habitable zone. But that's more to it. All these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven exoplanets are with a size that's similar to our Earth or even smaller. This means that all these seven bodies are probably rocky planets. And it's a surprise because now we know that there may be many rocky planets like our own Earth with the size of our own Earth drifting around in space around other stars. And we only need space instruments and scientists to discover them. So it's not about that the Earth is unique, it's about that it's very hard to see small planets. But here they are. They are here and we can search for life on them. And maybe the best way to start searching for life is to ask the question, why do we search for exoplanets in the first place? Why are we spending public money for this? So one of the most important answers is first that this is the only way that we will for sure discover the origin of life itself. Because we know that life may have come from space. Last week, just a few days ago, astronomers reported of the first extrasolar comet discovered, of the first alien comet discovered. This means that comets or asteroids can travel between stars and bring the building blocks of life. So when we are searching for exoplanets, we might find the first life, the primitive life forms that came to Earth 3.9 billion years ago. So if we want to discover the secret of life, we should search for exoplanets. And maybe, maybe we can start this search here in our solar system. Of course, we should look for another exoplanet, maybe to move the human, humankind there, but we can learn a lot by studying our planets here in our solar system. And one of the best candidates is, of course, Mars, the red planet. So, in uh, September 2015, I'm sure you, you know very well that this young physicist, this young astronomer, he proved using the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that there is liquid water, salty liquid water on Mars today. This is very important. If there is water, liquid water, even salty one, this means that there might be life there. So Mars is one of the hottest topic in astronomy research right now. And Europe is part of this research because we have the ExoMars mission. Right now, the ExoMars is orbiting around Mars and taking information about its atmosphere. So, if you want to be part of this effort, you can check the European-Russian ExoMars mission. And there is more in the solar system than Mars. We have the biggest planet, Jupiter, and one of its many satellites, Europa. So Europa is one of the most interesting moons of Jupiter because new results have proved that there is liquid water just beyond the ice crust of Europe. This means that Europa can be a place that can harbor life, maybe alien fish, who knows. But in order to understand this, we need a new space mission. And this mission is backed by the European Space Agency. This is the Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission and it's set to launch in 2022. So for all of you who are, who are students right now, choose astronomy 
and study astronomy at the university because in as little as five to six years we will go and search for aliens on Europa and you can be part of this journey and if you're going to go beyond Jupiter well you can always study Saturn Saturn and its marvelous rings and around Saturn there are more than 60 moons one of them is Enceladus Enceladus is also a very interesting place because we know from the Cassini analysis from the Cassini mission who was just destroyed into the atmosphere of Saturn to save the possible alien life forms on Enceladus we know that the geysers here contain suitable material for life to exist the food for life is here and based on the analysis of Enceladus we know that there might be a liquid ocean beyond the ice crust here as well so you have liquid water and heat you have geysers with food so maybe you have alien life here so that's why Enceladus is also one of the most important places to search for and maybe find alien life forms and it's also very important in order to understand what are the exact conditions that are suitable for life to start this is one of the biggest riddle in biology we don't know how life started and astrobiology the discipline that combines astronomy with biology is holding the key to this question to the answer of this question and as a final step in our journey I would like to ask ourselves why do we need to study space why do we need to study the cosmos as long as humankind has remembered as long as history existed we humans have always looked up in space and we have always been searching for our place in the universe let, here let me show you one of the oldest myths of creation so this is the ancient Egyptian myth of creation and here you can see the goddess of water Nun who is lifting the boat of the sun god Ra and Ra is of course giving rise to the sun and start of the universe so this is one of the ancient myths of creation right now we have a better story we have the science story we know that the universe began in a big bang and a few million years after the big bang the universe cooled down and just 300 million years after the bang the first stars formed the stars, the, the first stars, the so-called population tree stars were very massive and when they exploded they give rise to a very fast star formation and they also enriched the environment with heavy elements and now we know that this enrichment with heavy elements is crucial for life to evolve because only in the course of heavy stars can we synthesize elements heavier than iron this means that only thanks to the explosion of a supernova in the last five billion years when our solar system was just a baby solar system thanks to this explosion in the birth of our solar system we have the iron in our blood all the heavy elements in our body everything that's heavier than iron is actually produced in stars at least one star exploded when our solar system was forming and if this wasn't the case we wouldn't be here today this means that as Carl Sagan used to point out we are really made of stardust we are really having a piece of a star inside us and when we are studying space this means that we are studying ourselves the story of humankind is written into the stars and we should go there and learn it and discover it and I'll finish with one more quote from Carl Sagan so imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were but without it we will go nowhere now 
thanks to the evolution of space technologies, thanks to space education, and thanks to projects like space awareness, many more people can, can enjoy the beauty of space. Now, thanks to science, we can go anywhere. So, let's do it. This was the short presentation I have been preparing for you guys. And now, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Vladimir. It was very interesting and uh, inspiring uh, presentation. And uh, I don't see that much um, uh -huh, that much questions, but uh, maybe we can start with the light, uh, light question from me. So, um, when actually we can, uh, when we can already pack the suitcases and go fishing in lakes and rivers on exoplanets? <laughs> Uh, if we believe Elon Musk, Elon Musk, the founder of SpaceX, a Tesla motor company, and one of the most most uh, intelligent people, um, one of the visionaries here in, on Earth, well, if we trust Elon Musk, next year there will be two space travelers that will go to the moon. So uh, the official information is saying that two very rich people, names not mentioned so far, will travel to the moon. So the era of space tourism might be actually next year. But here we are talking about the moon. Next step in the next 10, if you are lucky, to 30, more probably years, will be to set a foot on Mars. So I suppose that uh, if you are very rich, very, very rich. Well, you can pack your suitcase in the next two years to the moon. But uh, maybe we should wait more, more than 30 years to set foot on Mars. But that's that's not so uh, that's not so long into the future when uh, when we are considering the astronomical time frame. Yeah. Yeah. True. Thank you very much for your answer. And I see that some of uh, participants were about to, s to ask the same question. So we already covered here. And uh, there are two more uh, related. Uh, they are mostly the same. They are related to search method of exoplanets. So uh, what is the most successful of uh, methods? And maybe a um, spoiler, what is a different method um, I, in addition to the um, transit method. Transit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, first I would like to thank the audience. It was it was a pleasure. I see many many comments. So uh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thanks also to to Ivo. He is the principal coordinator of the dissemination node for Bulgaria, and uh, I was invited into the project by Mr. Ivo Jokin. So Ivo, thank you so much. And I see that the question about the methods for the search of exoplanets is actually to miss, uh, belongs to Miss Tetsa Christova. So, hi Tetsa, yeah. it's a very, very good question. So, of course, we can have a direct imaging. The best way, uh, actually, every astronomer is very happy when you see the picture of the planet. It's very hard because planets don't shine with their own light. So, uh, if you are searching for stars or galaxies, it's easier. But when you are searching for planets, you should find, actually, you should be very lucky, even with the best telescopes, even with the Hubble Space Telescope, or you can find another method. So, you have direct imaging. Uh, it's not very successful in terms of the number of planets discovered, but it's very important in terms of data. If you have direct imaging, this means direct confirmation and maybe direct atmosphere imaging. Then we have the transit method, and the most successful so far is the so-called radio velocity method. So the majority of exoplanets was found with this method. So what is it all about? Well, imagine the Earth and the moon. So, of course, the moon is orbiting around Earth thanks to this that the Earth is much heavier than the moon. But uh, Earth is making corrections to the orbit of the moon, but the moon is also experiencing gravity influence on Earth. So, this means that when you have a two or more body system, this means that the gravity of every body in space is important. So if you have a star and a planet, this means that you can see small small change in the position of a star. Small change in the position of the star 
if you compare observations for many nights. This change in the, in the radial velocity of the star, this change in the spectrum of the star, is actually indicating that there is another hidden body. It's not transiting, it's not imaged directly, but it's gravitationally influencing the star. So this is the most successful, the most uh, used method for planet candidates. When you have this method, then you will begin the search for transits or direct imaging to, com to confirm the finding. Okay, thanks. I think you satisfied uh, most, <laughs> most of participants and they got their answer. And, um, and I see that people call me mind reader <laughs> because I ask the same questions, but I'm also interested in this topic, so uh, yeah. <laughs> But, and maybe something related to the project, you mentioned that um, there are a lot of uh, kind of new uh, job opportunities in this, um, in, rele in the relevance of new um, discoveries. So yes. what do you think there will be a um, future uh, job positions for, uh, for children who studies now astronomy? Okay, so there are many job openings in astronomy and in science in general. So, of course, the obvious answer is you can always be a teacher or a professor at the university. But the world today is not limited to high schools, universities or higher education institutions. Now, if you learn science and astronomy, you're learning every programming language. So, you learn how to be a programmer you also learn how to make statistic analysis of data. This means that you can be a banker and you will use the same analysis that we astronomers and actually all scientists do. So if you study astronomy and astrophysics, you will learn first how to be a programmer, how to be a banker, how to analyze data and even more. You will be more competitive than a person who has graduated from economics or just a programming school because you will know how are what are the basic walls of the universe. This means that you have a broad picture. You will know how to think outside of the box because science and astronomy is teaching a simple thing. You have a riddle, you have a problem and the, what is the method to solve this problem? These problems can be solved by the scientific approach. So uh, you have many job openings outside of science, even if you study science. But what will you have in science? So nowadays the European Commission is spreading the news about co-creation. And this means that science is created not only with the funding of the society, but science is created with the active help of society. This means that every citizen, every student, even in uh, primary school, should engage and will be engaged into science research because science is for everyone and it's not bound by age or by education. So this means that there will be many job openings in citizen science projects like Planet Hunters or for startups. If you have the entrepreneur's spirit, if you are a student, even a high school student, and you have an idea, it's very easy to make this idea a reality. There are a number of funds in Bulgaria, in the European Union, even outside the European Union, who are funding startup ideas into space and innovation. So you can be an entrepreneur, even like Elon Musk. I see here in the comments that there is a question about my, my, my opinion for Elon Musk's idea to go on Mars. I strongly support this. I think that this is one of the best ideas. Well, it might sound like a crazy one, but it's doable. And if you have the funds and you have the vision, it's just a matter of being persistent. So I believe in Elon Musk's trip to Mars. I think it's feasible. And this is a very good job opening in astronomy as well. Also, you have the science communication career. I'm not only a university teacher, I'm also a journalist. I'm the head of a popular science magazine in Bulgaria. This is the BBC Knowledge Magazine. 
in the UK it's uh, the Science World or BBC Focus magazine. So I'm the editor-in-chief of this magazine for the last three years. I've been part of the team for the last five years and I started by writing popular science articles about astronomy. So you can be a journalist, you can be a scientist, you can be an entrepreneur. All this is in astronomy and in science. So there is a, a tremendous amount of opportunities even in, uh, in, even in uh, the government of administration. Nowadays it's uh, very common for uh, an academician to go to the government career. So it, it's, it, it's a good career choice and being an expert in one field is actually making you more, more strong, more competitive in a number of other careers. Okay, thanks, uh, Vladimir. So um, I saw also one participant recommended Citizen Science Project. It's a nice uh, opportunity for teachers and their students to um, to collaborate and actually to have a glimpse of uh, what scientists do in their real life to uh, support them and. Um, maybe have a, an international project with different schools. So it's a nice opportunity. If you're interested, just check in the internet or on the Space Awareness website. Yes. Uh, Citizen Science Project. Yes, yes. And uh, I think there is a comment. Yeah, Annalisa uh, commented that uh, science for everyone as a social contribution and uh, way of thinking and understanding reality, it's a nice vision of future. Yeah, I, I cannot agree more because, yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of uh, what we uh, have to, um, to show the uh, future generation of space explorers that there is a, um, not only a science, but also for uh, attitude to, um, to different nations and collaborations uh, and everything is possible with, uh, with the attitude. Exactly, and exactly, yes. And uh, I see uh, a question from Lydia. I appreciate mentioning the young students, such as students in the primary school, as we need more awareness about this topic. Mm -hmm. Thanks indeed, very interesting. And coming back to this, uh, so I, I believe that we need to start young and uh, Space Awareness Project is uh, dedicated to this, uh, to educate uh, children from very, very young age. And maybe you can tell us more about initiative you have in Bulgaria about this uh, Mosaico yes. uh, club. Uh, I think people will be interested to hear what, what is um, done on national level in Bulgaria. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's a very interesting story. So, in Bulgaria, we have the biggest science museum for children in Eastern Europe. It's called Mosaico. So, I can, I can actually write it here as we speak. It's mm -hmm. called Mosaico. Uh, this means a uh, small museum, but it's not small at all. It's uh, funded by the America for Bulgaria Foundation and it's actually containing more than 180 interactive attractions that are aimed to increase science interest into kids and their parents. And with uh, four other colleagues, we are actually leading the planetarium of Mosaico. This means that uh, we have created a number of special shows, of, of special lectures dedicated to children, and uh, six days every week, non-stop, we are showing what is the beauty of the planets in our solar system, what are the different constellations, and what is the sky right now, and what you can do tonight with your parents if you walk into the sky. So we have a number of shows, and in the last two years, Mosaico had more than 200,000 visitors, and the planetarium alone has more than 30,000 visitors. So this is, a, this, a, this is a huge number of visitors. Actually, I encourage all people from Europe and around the world, when you come to Bulgaria, please visit Mosaico. It's one of the most exciting places to learn about communicating science to children. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't see any uh, other comments except thank you. And we really appreciate this session. And it was very interesting. So um, well, actually, if you have actually, I, saw, I saw one question. Sorry, sorry uh -huh. to interrupt. I, I saw one, one question about uh, what is the possible number of exoplanets that can uh, have life on it? 
It oh, yeah, I missed this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, true. <laughs> I think, yes, sorry about this. I just, because it's, it's a very interesting question. Actually, yeah, sure. it's, it's uh, uh, we have the so called Fermi's paradox. So, Enrico Fermi, the famous Italian uh, physicist, actually answered the question uh, this way. So, space is very big, so there should be aliens around our Milky Way. But given the age of the universe, and given the size of the Milky Way, 100 light years, this means that we should have alien ships zipping around. But that's not the case. So, where are they? If we are not alone, where are the aliens? And uh, Drake, Frank Drake, in the 60s of the, tw of the last century, he actually answered this by calculating a formula. It was a for formula who was taking into account the number of planets. Well, of course, then he didn't know the exoplanets he discovered. The first one was indeed discovered by Hubble Space Telescope, as one of the uh, one of the colleagues here mentioned. But uh, Drake used the possible number of planets, the possible number of stars like our own sun. He tried to calculate the probability of life on every of these planets, the probability of life not to destroy itself. And then he came with a number. And the problem is that when you have so many parameters, then you can give every answer you want to. For example, I have a paper in 2010, it's been published in the International Journal of Astrobiology, and uh, actually we can prove that you may have more than 100, this is, the, this is the concrete answer to the question, you can have more than 100 planets with a civilization at the technological level of mankind right now in our Milky Way. But thanks to the vastness of space and thanks to the limit of the speed of light as a mean of communication, they can never exchange they can never exchange signals so i will answer to to the question of uh, of the audience that you may have more than a hundred planets but thanks to to the vastness of space maybe they will never meet thank you it's, it was a brilliant webinar i guess and uh, everyone is agree with me <laughs> It was very interesting and very clear, so uh, I think people are inspired now and they will be more aware about the exoplanets and uh, possibility of life uh, just next to us around the corner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, the recording of this webinar will be available in a couple of days on the Space Awareness website and also uh, we will attach the presentation from today's webinar he, there on the web page. So uh, I will send a follow-up email to all the participants and you will be able to enjoy once more the recording. Uh, I see. Thank you and <laughs> Mr. Bajilov rocks. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. And come visit Bulgaria, come visit Bulgaria and uh, we'll talk more on life. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, Vladimir. It was very nice. Very nice. For me too, so, it was a pleasure. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you and see you in Sofia. See you. Bye-bye.